Today, today we are going to begin in earnest, in earnest, our training to live our lives on mission. Uh, specifically, the mission that Jesus, you know, our Lord and King, commanded us to live, uh, the mission of being and making disciples. We find this in Matthew 28, where Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, as you are going, <laughs> make disciples of all people baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now as I explained last week, this command was not and is not only for the professional and vocational ministers. This command is for everyone, everyone who claims to be a disciple of Jesus. And mind you, Biblically speaking, there is no such thing as a Christian who is not a disciple. Disciple is not some upper level of Christianity. In short, if you are not a true disciple, then you are not a true Christian, not truly saved. Jesus himself made this crystal clear when he said in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, not everyone who says a little prayer and puts the Christian hat on, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. A disciple is someone who does the will of the Father. As I showed you from the simplified version of what Jesus said in the Great Commission, a disciple is someone who knows God personally, intimately, and does what he says. And even more specific, someone who knows Jesus personally and intimately and does everything that he says, which is exactly what we covered over the summer, if you recall. And summarized into the statement that we have on the wall, let your light shine by the way you live, the narrow way of love. And it consists of these major aspects as I've shared before. Sacrifice yourself, lay down your rights, love your enemies, uh, storing heaven treasure, not earth treasure, no complaining. No complaining. Um, forgiving fully, staying pure, trusting God, and as we are covering now, replicate. Replicate. Don't just be a disciple. You have to make more. And remember that the disciple-making process is simply the process of helping someone else know God personally and do what he says, just like you do yourself. It's really quite simple. So biblically speaking, a disciple and a disciple-maker are one and the same thing. You cannot have one without the other. It's a package deal. You cannot, this is important, you cannot be a true disciple if you ignore the command of Jesus to make more disciples. And you cannot actually obey that command and make more disciples if you are not one yourself. Which is why I'm not going to stop talking about this. In fact, I may commission Lauren to paint these things on the wall over there in those spaces we got left. Because with what we are called to do as the true followers of Jesus, these things are not optional. And we cannot afford, this is important, we cannot afford to shift our focus all on seeking and saving the lost and then lose our own selves in the process because we forget to first and foremost be disciples before trying to make other disciples. All right? Now, all that bit about shining our light and living the narrow way of love is only half of what it means to be a disciple. It's the do what he says part. The other half, and really the first half, is what we <coughs> that we must be baptized into the name of our triune God we must be individually and corporately immersed into the identity of, the knowledge of, the worship of, and the glory of the Father, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We must each know God personally and intimately and on a continually growing basis, which consequently is the only way that we are actually able to do what he says. <laughs> Jesus said it best in John 15. He said, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch uh, that is thrown away and withered. As such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, you can ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So Jesus makes it clear that the primary duty of a disciple is that we abide in him. That we immerse ourselves into the knowledge of, identity of, worship of, and glory of him, Jesus Christ. Specifically, by maintaining his words in our minds and hearts. 
In other words, we need to each be reading or listening to our Bibles every single day. We must do as Paul says in Romans 12, that you cannot conform to the pattern of this world, which cares nothing of God, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Then, and only then, as Jesus himself says here, we can ask whatever we wish, and it will be done for us, and we will bear much fruit. In other words, be able to obey his teachings to the glory of God the Father. Now combine that with 1 John 6, which we covered last week. We know that we have come to know him. 1 John 2, sorry. If we, come to, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. And whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. The truth is not in that person. In other words, it's a both-and situation. We often find these things with God. Just like you cannot be a disciple without making disciples, and you cannot make disciples without being a disciple, you cannot do what God says if you do not know him, and you cannot know him unless you do what he says. It's a both-and. It's a package. It's the truth that anything good and godly that we hope to do in the horizontal among other human beings, like living our lives on mission, must come from the overflow of the vertical relationship with God. I've covered this before. If we do not have this right, if we do not have our vertical relationships right, we have no hope, no hope whatsoever of fulfilling God's calling on our church or our lives. And so before we continue with the teaching today, we need to make this right. Now, if you are here with us today, I'm assuming that you were either here last week and watched the video, or you watched the video, and that you know what we're about to embark upon, and your presence here today means that you want in. That you want to do this. You want to live life on mission. And so I'm also assuming that I'm talking to a room full of true disciples. True disciples of Jesus who want nothing more than to intimately know our Lord and Savior and do what he says. This is what we want at the core of our being, even if we're not perfect at it. <laughs> in fact, it's quite possible that despite that desire of our hearts, many of us in this room have slipped a bit in our devotion to the vertical relationship, perhaps, in recent weeks or months. Not because we don't want it, not because we don't desire it, but life and things just seem to get in the way and the next thing you know it's been a while since you you know read your bible or, or prayed i myself i have experienced seasons like this myself it's nothing unordinary among us human beings so i do not say all of this to make you feel guilty but to show you that we are you're not alone in this struggle and also to give us all an opportunity to start afresh today right here and right now together in this room so here's what going to do. Remember I told you that we're going to do things different. <laughs> well, it's about to get very real in this place, okay? The book of James tells us that we are to confess our sins to each other and pray for each other so that we may be healed. Now, the healing he's talking about there is not necessarily physical, though it can be. It's spiritual as well. And the truth of the matter is, is that as we as individuals, if we are running on empty in our vertical relationships, then we are very much in need of spiritual healing, spiritual wholeness. And so, we are going to spend the next few minutes at our tables confessing our sins to each other. But don't freak out. Not all of our sins. All right. Just one in particular. The sin of not abiding in the vine. All right. So I've already established that we're probably all guilty of skipping a few days here and there. All right. And remember... That sin is anything we do that is driven by our own will rather than God's will. And so anytime we go a day without spending some time with our Lord, that is not his will. <laughs> and so it's a sin and literally makes us spiritually sick, a sickness that we can be healed of right here and right now as we confess it to each other, repent, and pray for each other. So at each table, here's what I want you to do. In a minute, when I'm done talking or giving instructions at your tables, pair up with someone that you do not live with. Pair up with somebody that you do not live with. And so if you have to go to a different table, do so. All right? Um, and uh, once we're paired up, we're going to spend the next few minutes talking to each other in your pairs. And I know this is going to be awkward and strange, but that's okay. And I want you to simply confess 
So what you do is you specifically you confess to your partner how many days in this past week since last Sunday did you not read at least one verse in your Bible? Okay? I'm not asking how many hours you spent in studying or in quiet time, but how many days during this past week did you go without reading at least one verse in your Bible, such as the verse of the day in the YouVersion app? That's a good example. How many days did you not open your Bible or your Bible app at all? Now, if you haven't read your Bible at all, don't be ashamed. Okay. If you read it every single day, don't be proud. All right? Just be honest. Own the truth, knowing that you're already forgiven. You're already forgiven for any shortcomings, and today is a new day. And if we don't flesh this out, it'll just continue the same that it's been. And we can't afford to do that, guys. So I know this is going to be uncomfortable, but it'll be okay. All right? You trust me. And then... Verbally repent, which means to decide to change. In your own words, with your partner, commit, with God's help, to doing it right from now on. Perhaps even spell out your plan. A very good one would be simply to commit to reading the daily verse in the YouVersion app. If you have the YouVersion app, it literally takes seconds, seconds to open the app. It's right there, the first thing. It's one verse, and you can read it. And the YouVersion app is so cool, it actually tracks for you when you open the app. And so it'll show you how many days in a row you it doesn't even say whether you've read anything, it's how many days in a row you've opened the app. So you can kind of keep a little tracker. And once you get certain numbers, it gives you confetti and things like that. And so I do this every single morning before I get out of bed. And sometimes I'm a pastor, that's the only thing I do during that day. Sometimes that's the only Bible I read that day. But you know what? Every single day I make a point before I get out of bed and they call me the test of open my phone, just like we all do, right? and I'll check our phone before we get out of bed, mostly. And I just open the Bible app, I see the verse of the day, good to go, I got a verse. Now, usually I do more than that eventually today, but at least I do that. And so, that's something that I would recommend to you if you're having trouble keeping up to at least a verse a day, let you version help you out. That's good. And then, Pray for each other. Ask God to help you keep this commitment. Whatever you plan to do, whether it's you, you're committing, you know what, I'm going to read the verse of the day every day this week. And I'm not asking for a commitment for the next 10 years, but just for this next week. What will you commit to do this week to refresh your connection to the vine? And then pray for each other in your little pairs that you will meet those commitments. And maybe you can <laughs> talk about ways that you can help each other to do that. Perhaps text each other, I don't know, something like that. You don't have to, but that, that part's optional. Any questions? There will be more teaching and stuff after this part. So, Any questions? Anybody freaked out? Yeah? One question. Like, if we're with our partners, is it okay if, like, maybe we confess, like, the small things we did that week, too? <coughs> or just, just... Not today. Week? Okay. We'll do that next week. Okay. <clears throat> Now, today, just stick with the one thing, right? The so goal of this exercise is, is for all of us to start over. Let's get back on board abiding in the vine. Get back to abiding in the vine. We, we need, we, my friends, we need to do this. We need to be in the Word. We need to be abiding in the vine. Each one of us as individuals, on at least a minimal basis. Otherwise, we have no hope whatsoever. Really, guys, no hope. Of doing anything for God. And so let us help each other. This is, this, is not, this is not an individual effort. This is a group effort. And that's why we're doing tables and things like this. Okay? You guys ready? All right. So I'll give you like one minute to find a partner. And then we'll go. All right? So if you have to go to, go to a different table, do so. Go. It's time to resume. It's time to uh, move on with our learning today. You can stay at your seat or go to your original one. I mean, need to move it around again anyway. So, uh, don't worry, that's not the end of the uh, discussion. So that wasn't so bad, was it? Huh? Huh? Not too bad, right? Well, very good. If it felt awkward, don't worry. It won't be the last time to do something like this. So it'll get more normal as we practice. The more we do this, the more normal it will feel.
All right, so now that we have all reset ourselves and committed to being true disciples, knowing Jesus and doing what he says, we can now start talking about how to make disciples. All right, beginning with the absolute most important part of the process, which is prayer. Prayer. In our pattern of discipleship that follows the acronym PRISM, uh, pray, relate, invite, show, merge, prayer comes first. We will spend the rest of today and at least the next two weeks training on this. Like I said, we are not in a hurry, not in a hurry. Prayer is a major topic in the Bible. Jesus talked about it and practiced it quite a bit, as did Paul. And the longest book in the Bible, the book of Psalms, is quite literally a book of prayer. Um, outside the Bible, countless books have been written on the subject ever since people can write. But of all the things written and all the things said about it through the ages, none could do better than the simple yet profound prayer that Jesus himself taught to his disciples. Will you read it with me? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Now, one important thing to note about this prayer is that it's often overlooked. It is not the prayer of an individual. It is the prayer of a group. Our Father, our daily bread, our sins, and so on. Not to say that you cannot pray this on your own, but once again, Jesus wants us to be together. To be together, and even when we can't be together, to have a together mindset. When you pray this by yourself, you should still say, Our Father. Because you're connected with all the other believers, all the other children. Okay? A great deal more could be said about this prayer, but today I want to focus briefly on the first half. Because it sets the tone for everything that we will be doing from this point forward. It begins with, Our Father in Heaven. I told you that the discipleship process is God-driven from beginning to end. Well, part of that means that at the beginning of all of our prayers, we must put God in his proper place in our hearts and minds. One, he is our Father. We are his children, adopted into the family, brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ himself. 1 John 3, 1, see what great love the Father has lavished upon us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. This means that when we pray, it's not as lowly slaves and servants, but as beloved children of all God, Almighty God. He loves us, and He calls us His own. There's no reason to be afraid or to cower in His presence, but we must also show Him the proper respect. Hallowed be Your name. God, You are our Father, but You are high above us. You are holy, not like us, <laughs> not like our earthly fathers. We must not make the mistake of thinking that God is like us just because in some ways we're a little bit like him. All right? God, our Father, you are in heaven, and you are holy and in control of everything. Your, your ways and thoughts are higher and better than mine. You are holy. It's important that we spend, that when we pray, we spend a little time glorifying and honoring God, our Father. It sets our hearts and minds in the right place to start addressing our earthly concerns. In fact, the very best way to make your own problems shrink is to focus just on how big our Father God really is. All right. Next, your kingdom come. It makes sense that this is this should be our first concern, right? Considering that later in the same Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells us to seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and then all of our other concerns will then be taken care of, right? The kingdom is the rule and reign of Christ. It's Jesus on the throne. It's Jesus as Lord, right? It's ultimately the point of the Gospels. We are to pray for God's kingdom to come, that it be established now in the hearts of men and women, and later is the promised physical millennial kingdom. It's the, pr it's the prayer for God to set all things right in the world, which will only happen when your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The world is broken because we as human beings rebelled against God's will and decided to do things our own way the definition of sin. But the good news is that Jesus took care of that with the work he did on the cross, and now we, who are born again, new creations, forgiven sons and daughters, we can, by the power of the Holy Spirit, say, just as Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. My friends, this is the very essence of prayer. 
This is what prayer ultimately is. Because as I've taught before, the Greek word behind prayer, prosukamai in the New Testament, literally means to exchange wishes, to exchange wills. When we pray to God, what we are really doing is exchanging our own wills, wants, dreams, and desires for whatever He wills, wants, dreams, and desires for us. This is the running theme in Jesus talking about prayer. John 14, 13, he says, I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. That doesn't mean tack Jesus' name on the end of a prayer. The whole in my name ultimately means according to my will. Ask anything that is according to my will. Exchange your will for my will, and guess what? I'll say yes. Another place he says this, we've already looked at today, John 15, if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. You will know his will if you know his word. His words, right? His words, if they remain in you, then you'll know his will. That's what Paul says in Romans 12. If you're transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you'll be able to know God's will. Then you'll be able to ask for the right things. And John later actually spells it out, 1 John 5. He says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. Prayer is not asking God to bend to our will. It's allowing God to bend us to his. Prayer is not asking God to bend to our will. It's saying, God, not my will but yours. Make my will line up with yours. And then obey. And the one thing that is guaranteed to be in his will that he definitely wants us to be praying about is the salvation of the lost. The salvation of the lost. We know this because it is spelled out in two different places in scripture. One is in 2 Peter chapter 3. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. What? Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God does not want anyone to perish. He does want everyone to come to repentance. It is God's will for that to happen. In 2 verse Timothy chapter 2, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who what? Who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. In two places in Scripture, to be a two different authors, God tells us explicitly that His will is that none should perish. And that everyone would come to repentance, to come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved. This is what God wants. So you can be certain that if you are praying for the salvation of someone, that you are indeed asking for something that is according to God's will. And in the name of Jesus. It says it right here in two places, right? In fact, as you just saw, Paul actually urges us to do just this. To pray for all people. Kings even, in that respect, because it pleases God our Savior. Sometimes it's not easy to figure out if something is God's will or not, right? But in this case, it's a no-brainer. God wants us to pray for the lost. And as I explained last week, we, the lost, need us to pray for them more than they need anything else from us. They need us to pray for them, because as Jesus himself made clear, there is nothing we can do. Nothing we can do to bring someone closer to knowing him if God has not unlocked their heart and drawn them to himself. This point is so important that he said it twice, we'll show it again. The first was to the large crowd, and after he fed them in a miraculous way, he says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. No one can come to me. No one can come to me. They can't do it unless the Father draws them. And then he said later to his disciples, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless... Father has enabled him. So this is why praying comes first in the discipleship process and continues throughout. Before we ever talk to a person, and especially before we try to talk to them about God or, or the gospel, we must pray that God will unlock their heart and draw them to himself. Otherwise, all of our efforts are in vain at best and counterproductive at worst. We're trying to save people with our own power and strength to do more damage than good. We must go to the Father 
our Heavenly Father and say, Lord, this person needs it, but I can't do it. Will you do your part? And so, that's what we're going to start doing right now. <laughs> really, this is about the easiest thing in the world to do. This is, this is the easiest part of this whole process. There's no, it's no pressure, and it's totally God-driven, because all you have to do, we're going to do this in a minute, all you have to do is ask the Lord, who do you want me to pray for? You don't have to sit down and go through your family tree and your high school yearbook. And, you, know, you just say, Lord, who do you want me to pray for? And he will give you names. He may give you one, he may give you a hundred, I don't know. He knows who he wants you to pray for. Possibly family members, friends, co-workers, etc. You don't have to, you don't have to try to think of everyone. Just ask the Lord, who do you want me to be praying for? It's God driven, remember? God driven. Who do you want me to be praying for? And then write it down. And then pray for them. <laughs> and you don't have to get fancy or use a lot of words or be a, be a preacher prayer. All you gotta do is say, Lord, will you please unlock Susie's heart? Will you please draw her to your soul? Lord, will you please reveal yourself to Susie? Open her heart to believe in you? That's it. And then you can perhaps, you know, say, and you can use me if you want, God, <laughs> in that process. But just ask that God will do his part that we learn. It doesn't really matter how exactly you say it, as long as the key elements of God unlock or enable their heart. Draw himself, draw them, or reveal yourself in some way. God has to initiate the salvation process, and then, uh, you know, offer yourself as a tool. That's it. And so, here's what we're going to do right now. At your tables, there should be index cards and pens, sticky notes, and sharpies. Each of you should get a pen and a uh, note card. And for the next ten minutes, next ten minutes, I'll set a timer. We're going to be silent as we each pray. This is, this is one thing we are going to do individually for the moment. Anyway. Pray and ask God for the names of those he wants you praying for their salvation. And then write them down on your index card. And then if you have time, start writing their names, first name only, maybe a last initial on sticky notes, one each. We'll be doing something with those in a minute. Okay? Pretty simple. Any questions? All right. Here's an ace. Go. Nope. Right. Everybody doing all right? Okay. okay. So now that we have the names that God has given us, and I do mean us, this is important, guys. This is, again, not an individual effort. It's not something you are doing by yourself something we are doing together. Okay? So now what we're going to do is we're going to take turns as tables, each table. Um, when it's your turn, you'll get up and take your sticky notes. So if you haven't done so yet, write the names. Uh, you'll have time. So uh, Write the names, first name, maybe last initial of those that are on your list on a sticky note each. And you're going to take those sticky notes over to the newly dawned prayer corner, right, right over there where uh, Josh and Lauren made a really beautiful cross, and then we stuck it to the wall. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the sticky notes, and again, as a table, we're going to go over there and using thumbtacks, we're going to nail these names to the cross. As you do so, those of you in your little group, pray for that individual person, that God would save them in the ways that we've discussed. And in the meantime, while one table is doing their thing, the rest of us spend time talking at your table about the names God has given you. You don't have to share lots of private information, but share with the people at your table or maybe the partner you, you gained before and just talk about well, these are the names God laid on my heart and, and what you know about them because here's the deal. We pray for each other's names as well. It doesn't mean you have to go home with a list of 100 names and feel obligated to pray, like, but just... We're in this together, you understand? So as we share stories with each other, as we share these names and, and, and things God has given us, then that makes it more of an us and less of a me, okay? And so then after we do that, we're going to do that for as long as it takes, 
um, but also we're committing. So what we're doing now is you take these index cards home with you and you turn it into whatever medium you like, if you like it on your phone or whatever else, but you commit to pray for these names, okay, during the week. In fact, I, I really encourage you to commit to every day at the same time that you already committed to read your Bible a minute ago. Pull out that list, and you don't have to necessarily go name by name and take a long time doing it. Just say, Lord, you know these names. I pray that you, you know, whatever works for you, okay? But just lift those names to the Lord once every day this week, okay? And we can all commit to that. And then we'll see how we did at the end of the week. Okay, is there any questions about that? All right, well then, in that case, we'll start here with the table I was at with uh, Nicole and, and uh, Jan, and then we'll... Uh, We'll just circle around this way, and then uh, you guys will be last. Okay, let's go. Well, thank you guys for uh, humoring me and uh, trying this thing out. Now, you guys can't see it over there, so you might want to get up and see it. But if you look at this cross, it is completely covered in names. Wow. There's got to be at least 100 names right there. We know some people. <laughs> and this is a very small group today. We're not even all here. You know, Sandy's, you know, he's doing something. The Hammonds, Laurel. I mean, there's other people missing. Today. Yeah, Diane. Yeah. So think about this, guy. Just this, this, this one little morning. Look at that. This small little group of people. God has asked us to pray for this many people to come to know Him. Does it make the ninety percent a little bit more real? Yeah. yeah. That there really are people that we're surrounded by all the time that are living their lives apart from God. They don't have the, the, the blessing of being a child of the King and the Holy Spirit to guide and lead them. They're totally lost, wandering around in darkness, not knowing up from down and left from right. And not only that, if they happen to die today, they're going to go to hell forever. This is serious, my friends. This is the mission that we're on. Because these are lives. These are people just like you and me. The only difference between the names on that one and our names is that for whatever reason, they haven't said yes to Jesus yet. Maybe God has revealed himself. Maybe, you know, I, I believe that God has only obligated himself to reveal himself maybe one time to a person. And they can say no. They don't have to say yes. But we can still pray for them. And so we must. And who knows what avenues and paths God's going to take to cause any number of those names to then run in contact with us, and we might start relating with them, or if we already are relating to them in a different way, because it matters, guys. It matters. These are real people. And so I want us, every time we come into this building, every time we walk into this room on Sunday morning, to look at that and say, oh my God. Look at all the lives that he's caused just this small. I mean, imagine if Grace Bible Church did something like this. They'd fill an entire building with sticky notes. But he's called us, for whatever reason, to be intentional about making disciples. And these are the disciples he wants us to make. So we must be about the business of doing it. Which means we must be, every day, touching God a little bit. Even if it's just a verse out of the Bible, even if it's just a five-minute prayer, make that five-minute prayer be the names that you wrote down. He didn't give them to you for no reason. No. Right here. This is important, God. This matters immensely. Let's not walk away from here and forget. And this will be a reminder to us every time that we don't even have enough room on this cross. But the beautiful thing is there's plenty of room on the cross for every single one of us. And so week after week, we're going to focus on this. Week after week, we're going to spend time in prayer, at our tables, putting new names up and celebrating, celebrating if we ever get a chance to take one of those names off and say, God saved this one. Let's, let's pray for those moments, guys. This is not a game. This is not just some little thing we're doing on Sunday and the rest of the week you can ignore. ignore. These are people's lives that are hanging in the balance, and God has called us to make a difference in their lives by first and foremost simply raising their names to his attention. And so can we do that? Can we commit to at least doing that? Yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Absolutely. Beautiful. Beautiful. Mr. Clayton, would you 
Mr. David Clayton, would you please <laughs> close us <laughs> in prayer? <laughs> Lord, we thank you for uh, being with us this morning, and we lift up those names. And we ask that you do whatever it takes to save their soul. Bring them down whatever path, whatever you need to do in their heart to wake them up, to shine, to remove the blinders and shine your light into their heart. And bring them into the saving knowledge of you. Oh, by your grace, reach down and touch those, those people. And Lord, I pray as we are challenged with these things, that you would uh, speak into our hearts. Uh, this Even this week, as we sit down and start praying, um, maybe there's something that's specific we should be praying for, for each one of those people that's on our list. Maybe a certain way that you say, hey, I, I want you to start praying this for them. Let you just speak to our hearts. Give us ears to hear, Lord as we mention these names up. And uh, Lord, uh, if there's any way that we are going to be a part of this, besides just praying, if there's something more that you want us to do, help us to be good hearers. And help us to obey. Even if it's totally uncomfortable to us. To be able to listen to you and to follow you. So that they may come to know you and that we can be your tool in your hand. So Lord, I just pray that as we are looking at our life on mission, that, uh, that we are hearing and that we are doing what we hear. So Lord, this week I pray you just uh, give us more passion uh, to be with you in our word, in the word and in prayer and, and even break our hearts for the people that, we, that surround us. Give us your heart, Lord. Give us your heart. And may that show to people around us that we have your heart. Because, Lord, you love them. We know you do. You love them more than we do. So, Lord, give us that. So, bless your people as they go. And uh, help us to hear. Help us to hear. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.